Subcommittee will come to order. Uh, while this hearing is meant to cover the range of issues facing the United States in the region stretching from Egypt to the Persian Gulf, in my opening remarks, I'd like to focus on Iran. Like many others, I've been thinking a lot of Iran, and despite my best efforts, I keep coming back to, of all things, the second Reagan administration. It was in the second term that President Reagan and Secretary of State George Shultz negotiated significant conventional and nuclear arms control agreements and helped thaw out the Cold War with frequent high-level summits. Throughout this period of intensive diplomatic engagement, however, President Reagan never stopped speaking powerfully and frequently about the dissidents, human rights, and freedom. Obviously, the Soviet challenge then and the Iranian challenge today are very different. But what really stands out is the way the Reagan team in the second term sustained a multifocal, steady, and comprehensive pressure on the Soviets. The summitry demonstrated that the problem was in Moscow, not in Washington. The consistent focus on human rights and freedom reminded domestic, allied, and Soviet audiences just how ugly the Soviet regime really was. Following some terrible strains in the transatlantic alliance in the first term, the Reagan administration worked hard on sustaining our relations in both Europe and East Asia to ensure that the Soviets had no political escape valve. Following the initial massive spasm of defense spending in the first term, the steady deployment of U.S. and NATO forces that were technologically passing by the Soviets simply couldn't be ignored. And of course, the intelligence community made life in the Kremlin miserable, not only by stealing secrets, but organizing and supporting opposition to the Soviets wherever it could take root. So in thinking about our Iran policy today, what strikes me is how thin it seems to be. We, see, we seem to be depending on just one or two policy elements when, in fact, many more are possible. President Obama's support for direct engagement with Iran, as with the Reagan-Gorbachev summitry that I've described, has already helped to heal a variety of political woes. But by itself, diplomatic engagement still leaves too much initiative in the Iranian hands, likewise with economic sanctions. If the Iranians remain calcitrant and sanctions are applied, no matter how crippling, and I'd want them to be absolutely suffocating to the regime, the initiative is still left to the Ayatollahs to decide when they've had enough. But what seems most puzzling to me is that the administration appears to have absolutely nothing at all to say about Iran's green movement. Staying out of the way in June was smart, but the complete silence since then is, to me, inexplicable. Support within Iran for the nuclear program runs across the spectrum. But there's a strong case to be made that the Iranian regime went to Geneva and has bargained since then primarily because of their concern about domestic stability rather than fears about international sanctions. I've also heard from many leaders in the Middle East who complain that the Obama administration doesn't seem to have any better a plan for increasing the multilateral political and security coordination in the Persian Gulf than did their predecessors. And, with, and while the administration has increased American attention to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, at least in part to win broader Arab support for pressure against Iran, my question would be, where is the support? The Iranians are actively stirring up trouble or developing or maintaining the capacity to do so in Afghanistan, Iraq, Lebanon, the Palestinian territories, Egypt, Yemen, Bahrain, Kuwait, and Morocco. Where's the countervailing U.S. response? Where's the Truman-like policy of committing ourselves to support our allies in their struggle to remain free from threats and subversion? I am not suggesting another Cold War or holding up Iran as the new Soviet Union. My concern is that we're dealing with the Iranians piecemeal and thus giving them too much opportunity to shape events to their liking. And I'm not calling for linkage, where success in one area depends on success in one or more of the others. But I do think that we need a comprehensive approach. 
Like Gorbachev's, team, <clears throat> like Gorbachev's team, the regime in Tehran is facing an unprecedented challenge from within. Why is it then we seem incapable of taking advantage of this fact and bemoaning for years of the insufficiency of our leverage? We don't need to make threats, and we certainly shouldn't allow ourselves to get sucked into yet another conflict. But I can't help but wonder, why can't we squeeze with five fingers instead of just one or two? Thank you very much, Ambassador. Um, in, in your statement, you said that, um, with regard to Iran, that we're pursuing a, a two-track approach. Why not a comprehensive approach? Why not all of the things that I mentioned? Why, why is, is multiple choice not all of the above, just A and B? The dual track approach I, I mentioned is the one that we're pursuing with the, with the P5 plus one partners. That, and it's focused primarily on the nuclear file that causes so much, causes so much concern in the region and globally. But let me, let me assure you, Mr. Chairman, that we have, we have a pretty comprehensive understanding of the problems that Iran's behavior poses, and we're addressing these in different ways. I'll just mention four problems. One is Iran's nuclear ambition, big problem. A second is Iran's repression of its own people, its violation of its yeah, own people's no, human no. rights. We'll, we'll stipulate that, that you've made those points but, and that they're, that they're clear. I'm talking about the approach to those problems. Um, why not? Why not have a policy where that we are we are not only helping but utilizing the fact that they have this green movement going on over there? Why not utilize the fact that they have all these other countries that are, that are living in fear and trepidation of them every single day and work to line them up? Why not give an assurance, Truman-like, to to as many countries as we can there? That, um, that we are their protector and will protect them against any threat by Iran uh, under the following terms and conditions, and put in maybe a word about participating in sanctions or, or anything else that might fit in that. Why not all of these things at once? Mr. Chair, I believe we are addressing these issues that you, that you mentioned. Um, I don't know if, you, for example, there's much greater international emphasis now. I, I've not, I've not oh, with I'm all sorry. due respect, I've not heard a... A, an utterance about the green movement there. So I don't know how you're pursuing it, unless are we sending secret messages to the green movement or something? Or on the green on the green movement per se. Of course, this was this was um, an indigenous Iranian movement of the Iranian people, very heroically going out on the street. It was not anything orchestrated by the international community. Have we have we said that? Y yes. To this. I think that we've been clear. We've been saying it to each other. I think we all recognize that the, that the Iranians very courageously have taken to, the, have taken to the, the street after elections, are looking to see confirmation of some kind of legitimacy of their government institutions. We now have the opportunity, and we have used it, to speak to the Iranians directly about our concerns of what we saw afterwards. That was one of, the, one of the messages that was delivered to the Iranians directly on October 1st. We continue to provide support to civil society in Iran and across the region to create space for civil society voices to be heard, to be protected. Um, we continue to you look for other international fora in which we can highlight the abysmal practices that Iran... I don't, I don't want to... I want to move on yeah. uh, in this, and, and, uh, but I, I'll just make the point one more time. It, it would have been very helpful, I think, certainly not while it was occurring, because it would have made the regime's point that the thing is U.S. or Western-inspired. But afterwards, which includes today and tomorrow, uh, it might not be a bad idea to let people know uh, verbally, out loud, for the, all the world to see, including them, the kind of support, it, it, at least talk, that we appreciate what they're doing and, and, and that we're inspired by their courage. You know, some statement. doesn't have to be what I said, but something would be certainly helpful. 
to let them know they're not alone. Because, you know, I think everybody understands that that's probably in the interest of moving the ball forward. Uh, except we're not going to move the ball forward unless there's somebody there that appreciates it being moved forward and these people get some kind of encouragement. Let me, let me, um, let me ask you a, a question about uh, Lebanon, um, and, and then we'll move on. Um, in, the, in, the, um, in two areas where you're looking to improve our relations with, uh, with Syria, our relations as well as the Israeli-Syrian peace agreement, dialogue, or whatever, uh, are we going to be willing to pay for that in Lebanese coin? The answer is unequivocal, no. Our, our discussions with the Syrians, our dialogue with the Syrians, is not going to come at the expense of Lebanon's sovereignty. We are not trading away Lebanese sovereignty in order to gain something I, with Syria. I, I, Absolutely not. Great. I wanted to hear that on the record. Uh, uh, is the administration still committed to the full implementation of U.N. Security Council Resolution 1701? It's the, 1701 is actually the basis, the foundation stone of our policy with Lebanon, and we saw another violation of 1701 yesterday that just heightens our concern and the need um, to see that resolution fully implemented. A rocket was fired from Lebanon into, um, into Israel last night. The Israelis, the Israelis responded. It's a reminder that we need to reinvigorate this resolution. We need to, uh, to see this fully implemented by all parties. Lastly, our, is the administration going to support the special tribunal for Lebanon until it finishes its work and make no deals with any party that would jeopardize the tribunal's future. You know, we're, we are fully committed to supporting the tribunal until it finishes its work. We're not involved in the tribunal, um, which is as it should be. This is not a political tribunal. This is to bring justice to an unsolved um, assassination case and hopefully to bring the end of the air of impunity, and we will be fully supportive of that tribunal. Thank you, Mr. Ambassador.